So, so at my grandparents' house, where I would frequently be dropped off from time to time while my parents, you know, had a weekend together, you know, maybe actually were able to complete a sentence to one another, you know, that kind of thing, uh, I would go there and, and, and just, you know, spend the weekend with my grandparents. That's, you know, that's what you do sometimes. And, and so um, in that, one of the things that I, you know, would do is often take some toys with you. You fill the bag of, and for me, it was He-Man action figures or Transformers or that, that sort of just, if you want to know where I fall into age range, now you know. Um, so, uh, you know, and so what I would often do is take those things, and the fun part about taking those to Grandma's house is that in that particular living room, there's a whole other plethora of uh, adventures to have with your, you know, your grandparents' you know, house and how it's all lined out and laid out, right? And so um, I could do that, and that was a lot of fun, except at my grandparents' house, there's this one corner that was like the don't touch it corner, like the don't mess with it corner. And in the don't mess with it corner, there was this large leather-bound olive slash avocado kind of binding with gold lettering, Holy Bible. And on that Holy Bible, there was, as I recall, some image perhaps of the Last Supper, something of like that sort. And and to my young mind, I really thought this was some kind of relic that had come from like the 1300s that my family had somehow acquired. Um, And nobody ever talked to me about it. My, My grandparents were not overtly like religious people in the sense that like they read scripture out loud to me or tried to help me understand the scriptures. Um, But that Bible sat in that corner and I kind of knew um, like, you know, you have your adventures. He-Man's doing all kinds of things over here on the mantle and by the fireplace. But like around the corner, like you mess with the Bible section and grandma's going to like correct you. In, in a, a grandma kind of way. I mean, it wasn't, she wouldn't breathe fire or anything like that. But like, so, so one time I decided to get really bold. And I, and I like picked a time when like, the, the, you know, I didn't see anyone around. And I like opened this Bible that I was pretty convinced was, again, from like the 1300s. I later found out it dated to like the mid-60s. And uh, I really kind of thought something was going to happen. There was going to be this cloud where like an angelic being or something was going to emerge, maybe granting me wishes, maybe taking me to some kind of weird place. Um, The only cloud was the dust. And like I tried to read it. I tried to interact with it. It made no sense to me. I closed it up was scolded for messing with it, and I proceeded with my story. And and I got to tell you that, like, that, that, and if you're anything like me, um, that story kind of rings true because it, like, sort of plays to a lot of baggage I think maybe all of us have when it comes to certain spiritual practices, in this case, specifically interacting with the Scriptures, We may have come up in places that have a high view of Scripture, at least in terms of like, don't touch that, don't interact with that. And and yet, like, by immediate context clues, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of passion about that particular book and how anyone around us is living their lives. Um, It's something I'm supposed to understand, and yet I don't understand it at all, and all this like these and nows and those, and what are we dealing with, and what are we talking about? And so what we want to do is is just in my life, there had to be this point where there is something really mystical and profound that we believe is happening when we interact with the Scriptures together, which is why we're reading from the Bible and not the Sorcerer's Stone right? Like, uh, or Aesop's fables. And let's just get a couple lessons in our, in our head. It was, it, it'll take us out here to have a good lunch at Chipotle and to a fun conversation with your mom this afternoon. But we, we believe there's something transcendent, mystical, if you will, happening when we interact with the scriptures. But if we're honest, we've attributed a lot of approaches to this that are like sort of weird and not helpful and um, and, and perhaps, dare I even say, dangerous to actually understanding or dealing with the very thing that God's provided for us to, to learn and grow in a particular way. So, so what we want to do in this series with three things, the Bible, with prayer, and with pursuit of community, is maybe just to sort of like shine a light on um, some of the preconceptions that I think we bring into engaging with this um, that might help us, again, maybe engage with this just a bit better as, a, as individuals, as a collective, as a community. I can guarantee you, 
This is the only thing I can promise you today. I will not answer every question that you have about the Bible. I will not ease every frustration you have about the Bible. I'm, I'm not even sure I'll cross one off your list. But what I hope to do in our few minutes together is sort of, in the first two sections, maybe speak to some postures about engaging with the Scripture that might help us actually engage well with the Scriptures. And then secondarily, um, speak to these really practical things that might help us build a habit of that, uh, both as individuals and as a community. Um, our, our midweek stuff will be focused on the really practical, like find a version that makes sense to you, carve out some time during the week. So if you, if you, if you don't follow us on social media, I'll make a quick plug there, because this is really going to be about an overall posture as it relates, relates to interacting with the scriptures. The first point I'll share with you is, is this. This, as we approach the scriptures, as we approach the Bible, the Bible is not the object of our worship, but it points us to the one worthy to be worshipped. Now, this is the whole tension of my grandparents' house, is it not? That what, what I have now, as a 42-year-old man, come to believe is that this book wants to reveal to me who God is, what God did in relation to um, mankind, and how God cares for humanity. That, that God wants to be connected in relationship with me. And yet, in the living room, what was the posture? Don't touch. You're going to turn into some like Indiana Jones-ish like creature if you touch or interact or open that thing up. Like I was, I, I was, there's, there, certainly, right, we can have a sense of reverence, we can have a sense of awe, we can have a sense of respect, but one of the, the profound mysteries that just came up in my story, and perhaps it comes up in yours, is, is, that, is that sometimes, and real subtle, we've, we've kind of snuck in maybe this idea that it's like Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Right? right? Now, we have to be real subtle here because uh, this is a delicate topic, right? But, 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 but while we might believe that the Spirit of God communicates through the Scriptures— Right? The whole thing happening in the corner of my grandparents' living room was, was, was helping me miss the point of the Bible altogether. That what the Bible wanted to tell me was that God loved me, that I have a sinful nature, that I'm a bit of a mess, and yet I'm deeply loved by God. And here were the degrees to which God went to, to reconcile what's been fractured. That's the scriptures the story wants to tell. In Luke chapter 24, there's this section of the, the scriptures following the resurrection of Jesus. Now, what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four books of the Bible called the Gospels, do is they talk about the birth, to some degree, the public life and ministry of Jesus, but then ultimately Jesus' execution and the early church believed resurrection. And so in Luke chapter 24, you have this moment that Luke records— where, where all these disciples who were like, we're ride or die with you, Jesus. We're going to follow you all the way to the very end. Actually, upon his crucifixion, scatter like cockroaches in the light. I mean, they run. They are scared to death for their life. They are not having it. They don't want any part of it. And, um, and, and then in the moments that follow, you know, the day that we will come in a few months to celebrate Easter Sunday, you know, what the, what the early church believed was that you know, Jesus didn't just stay dead, that he rose again, right? Scandalous claim. One of the big, like, is this book credible or not? Let's interact with this. Let's enjoy this. Let's let it teach us. Let's learn from this. But in that Luke 24 passage, there is a lot of confusion amongst the disciples who are now trying to make sense as word is getting out that the neat, tidy stone put in front of Jesus' grave seems something is up. And there's a group, one of them is named Cleopas, that's like sort of looking kind of heavy-eyed and down, and Jesus approaches them and interacts with them and says, hey, what's going on? And then they kind of are like, are you new here? Like, they, they don't recognize Jesus, the, the text tells us. And as, as, as he interacts with them, uh, he begins to explain in verse 25 what's going on. He says, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them 
what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if we were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures with us? Now here's the, the, the delicious irony of all of this, is that th these young people, presumably, at some point in their life had memorized all of these texts, like knew them in and out, but had not seen them through the lens of the crucified Jesus. And, and, like, and, and when it was explained by Jesus to them in light of, here's how, here's how the law of Moses, here's how this stuff points to what is happening right now, something clicks for them. And I think it's an important posture for us to consider that, uh, that as we interact and, 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 and learn from the scriptures, let the scriptures speak to us, challenge us, encourage us, that when we're reading the scriptures, we're ultimately trying to learn about the character of God played out through the crucified and resurrected Jesus. Like that if we, if, that if we come to the text and we find ourselves confused, frustrated, where does this all fit in? What, what's going on here? That this is a posture for us to come back to that will help us deal with our frustration. It may not answer every question. It may not answer every question you have about councils and scribes and reliability, but it's at least a starting point for us to come back to and say, hey, what does it mean for us to, to, um, to really understand the Old Testament, to understand this New Testament, to understand what's happening here? Rich Voloda says it this way. He says that we can read the Bible every day and still have our hearts firmly against the ways of the kingdom of God. Until we read the Bible through the lens of the crucified Christ, our exegesis, otherwise known as what we draw out of the text, becomes subject to personal and political preference. And perhaps you feel very deeply in your bones the personal and political preferences that, that maybe so many people around you um, have, have attributed to the Scriptures. Um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, that if we, if, we, if we just fill ourselves full of this knowledge, but we don't attribute it to the resurrected Jesus, that, um, that they can be an instrument of death. Now, and Paul was a guy who used the Old Testament scriptures to justify the killing of people for not, for not aligning with his view. Right? So I think he knows something on that particular subject because perhaps he himself has done the very thing that he's speaking of there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So it's an important posture. Again, not solving 400 questions that you might have, but beginning to introduce and remind us when we're dealing with the scriptures, we're trying to find the crucified, resurrected Jesus, the reconciliation between God and mankind in, in this sacred text. And I think it begins to help us understand also then that what we're dealing with can, can, can really be sort of seen as the work of art and the masterpiece that it is, right? Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses... Um, 15 to 17, is, is written to, by Paul, a guy who I just referenced, to a young church leader named Timothy, who is sort of taking kind of ownership of, of a pastorate kind of position in a, in a very cosmopolitan city for its time. Um, and if you don't know this, like Paul helped start all kinds of churches in the belief that Jesus was credible, that Jesus was who he said he was, and that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of these shadows of the Old Testament. Right? And so, so setting up like, these little outposts and hubs of Christian community in first century cities, one of which is being led by Timothy, and oh, by the way, Timothy's, Timothy's going to pastor that now without Paul, his protege, like being there on his shoulder day in and day out, grinding it out with him. So here's what he says to him. He says, but as for you, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of because you know those who from you have learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God 
God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the tail end of that verse gets, dare I say, sort of weaponized or used to sort of live in this space of God says it, I believe it, that settles it. That's actually what a guy I went to, you know, at, a, at a church I was as part of in Kentucky would, would often say. And I know what he means by it. I know what he means by it. But what that fails to do is to sort of feel out the contextual nuances and difficulties of the particular moments that we find ourselves in. What is Paul actually telling Timothy? I'm not going to be here with you. But you've interacted with these scriptures since you were a young man. Like they've pointed you to the hope that you have in Jesus. Continue in these things and let them continue to, to, to read you, um, to, to speak to your picture of community, to correct you, to rebuke you, to challenge you. Understand what it is you're dealing with and reading. So because, because here's the deal, right? We can memorize all kinds of proverbs. We can memorize all kinds of letters. We can memorize all kinds of sayings. But if we don't apply them to the context they find themselves in, the type of literature we're reading, we will often make the Bible say things it didn't ever intend to say, or frankly, if we're honest, just get super confused, right? We kind of soundbite the scriptures. I'm like, wait a second. Did, yeah, did I say that? Yes. But, did I, did, what, but what did I mean? What was the context by which I said this particular thing? And, and so it's a, I think it's important for us, again, this is, this is not rocket science or something brand new to us, just, but just to say, hey, when we read this book that we call the Bible, right, there's actually 66 different books that compiled over different centuries over different languages with different voices that are brought together by this divine breath. I am not going to be able to fully, in the next 13 minutes and two seconds, answer all of your questions about how that came together, how that was inspired. There's a whole section of videos, I said, that I'm going to point you to in the middle of the week that we'll furnish for you that might help you wrestle well with those things. But, 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 but again, I think it's important for us. We just came out of a series called Proverbs, and one of the things we kept saying over and over, the Proverbs are probabilities, meaning you can find the, the person in life who lived to be 125 on cigarettes, whiskey, and fast food, but they're the exception to the rule. They're not the rule, right? Why? Because we were reading a book of probabilities. When we read a book of poetry, we see some really scandalous things said to God, and we're like, whoa, can you say that to God and not get struck by lightning? Because I opened the Bible halfway, and my grandmother, like, rebuked me. Like, you know, and the answer is, yeah, why? Because it's poetry. It's someone pouring their heart out before God. It's, there's, there's all kinds of resources, I think, to help us understand this, right? If we read Genesis 1 and 2 as a scientific booklet or a lab report, we will be very frustrated with Genesis 1 and 2, or we will be very frustrated with science. Like, we just will. Because we have to understand on some level what we're reading is Hebrew poetry, right? That has a particular way of sort of telling us the story about how God made the world. But it doesn't read like your lab report. It doesn't. Because your lab report is your lab report, and Hebrew poetry is Hebrew poetry. <laughs> Right? And so we can believe the Bible to be inspired and just even have a fundamental misunderstanding in that regard. Um, good, good observation from my life, if you just want a really practical application of this. I was a young person, excited about following Jesus. I came home from church. My, my mom went to watch a Lifetime movie because she did that a lot on Sunday afternoons. My dad was probably downstairs watching sports or mowing grass. I don't remember what time of year it was, but I remember I'm going to open the Bible, I'm going to deal with the Bible, and I read um, because some thing I heard that morning at church was like exciting to me, whether it was like, hey, you should read the Bible. Cool, I'm doing it. Or something, I, I don't remember the immediate context of why, but I remember reading something that said that if my right eye caused me to sin, I should gouge it out because it would be better for me to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to not enter the kingdom of God with two eyes. Okay, Okay, that's, that's a heavy lift for a young, vibrant 15-year-old just acquainting himself with scriptures. And, and like, I did have this moment. I mean, I don't want to dramatize this. Preachers can do that sometimes. Like, it was probably like 10 seconds where I was like, okay, I, I need to go out there and I need to get a butter knife and I need to just make sure I don't make a mess because, like, mom's in her happy place. <laughs> and she's not going to be in her happy place if I gouge my eye out and make a mess. 
But then I remembered I had just been to church, and as I recalled, at least that I could see, in a room full of people, most of them did not appear as if they had recently gouged their eyes out. I could not recall anybody, and I interacted with church, and, 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 and I went to a church where on the way out, like, you got, like, the firm, like, dual handshake from the pastor, like, good to see you in the house of the Lord, young man. Like, we're one of those, you know? And I didn't recall interacting with anyone who appeared had recently gouged their eyes out. So then I went to some study notes because someone had gotten me a study Bible. And I was like, oh, Jesus is using hyperbolic language. Oh, okay, I, I know. Okay, now I get it. Now I get it. But for, 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 for what, 30 seconds? There's this like spin up in me, right? As a young 15 year old, like if I don't take this immediately, literally, and, and, and truly, I believe that if Jesus were sitting here with me and go, yeah, if you had walked to the kitchen and gouged your eye out here, you would have missed the point, young man. You would have missed the point. The point was pay attention to how you're being formed. The stuff around you, it matters for your formation. You're always being formed. We're always being formed in our culture, in our time. Like, this is important for our consideration. That's what Jesus wants us to know. And, and I could riff on that, but it was just, it's an example of what I'm talking about. Now, here's, here's the thing, I think, in the Demystify series that makes, that just, I think, um, from my own spirit, I, this is just where I am, okay? Um, I, I went five years ago, very graciously, a group of people put together a really nice trip for my wife and I for our 15th anniversary, and we got to go to France. And uh, what a wonderful time that was. One of our, one of our trips was to go to the Louvre, um, famous art museum. And if you don't know, the, the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre. That's a, that's a famous art museum, a famous piece of art in the famous art museum, right? Perhaps one of the most famous art museums in the world, and perhaps the most famous piece of art in the world. What you may not know, if you've never, if you've been lived in like kind of the art space, and I dabble, that's it. I'm not a, an aficionado, as they say. Like, I wanted to see the Mona Lisa, because, you know, I'm in Paris, and when am I going to be in Paris next? I do not know the answer to this question. So let's go see the Mona Lisa. Now, first of all, if you don't know this, the, the Mona Lisa is comparatively very small. It's compared to the other works of art in the Louvre, it, it's not a huge peace. And it's also pretty notable, which means the entire globe has converged upon this small room to take in this art experience. Which means this, that as I'm trying to reflect on the implications of what the Mona Lisa might mean for my life, I am getting like everything short of kidney punched and kicked in the face to take in this breathtaking wonder. It was a bit disruptive to my experience, as I'm sure it would be to you. And I'm sure that my, like, big head and American, like, way of doing everything um, probably got in the way of someone else having a meaningful experience with the Mona Lisa. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I was like, I got as close as I could without committing a misdemeanor, grabbed a picture, and left. I was like, okay, because there's so much other stuff to see in this museum that is deeply meaningful to me. And I think, if I could just project something onto you for a moment, um, I think that that probably is a lot of our beef with the Bible, right? Like, it's really difficult for us to, to peel back the layers of the artistry, the wrestling with the implications of inspiration, because, because we have so much just jabbing at us from the baggage and the weird ways we've seen it weaponized to, um, to, to maybe the grandparent that's like, don't touch the Bible or you're going to catch fire, you know, to, to, to even just as a culture, sort of going, nah, we're modern people, and let's, we don't need that irrelevant nonsense. You know, trust yourself, right? Like, like there's, there is stuff kind of jabbing at us that we have to unpack, and, and, and honestly, the, reading the scriptures is active work in that regard, right? It requires us to kind of peel back those layers, which is why I think it's really good for us to do the work of working through the scriptures collectively 
you know, um, communally and individually. There's a story in, in the book of Acts about an Ethiopian eunuch that, that's trying to make sense of a, an Old Testament scroll of Isaiah that he's got. And, and one of the disciples, a guy named Philip, walks up to him and is like, hey, do you know what you're reading? And, uh, and he says, no, I, how could I unless someone explains it to me? Maybe you've been there with the Bible before, where you're like, I, yeah, I mean, I might be there right now. Like, make this make sense, right? And, and what Philip does is, is just to sit with him and to sort of bring his experience, his understanding of the thing that in Luke chapter 24 and there were days that follow, maybe he has experienced and that becomes a transformational moment for this person. It's one of the things that, uh, that what do we see here? We see, first of all, Philip entering that sacred responsibility of trying to make sense of, of what sometimes is a difficult thing to make sense of. But then we also see the willingness to sort of walk along with other people. Why is this important? Why? Because we have individual blind spots. We have, we have maybe collective blind spots as a culture. Um, perhaps our, our hyper-individualism. Our, our pleasure at all costs, our consumeristic tendencies can take certain things from the scriptures and make us like go, no, 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 I don't think that resolution. You know, I, I don't really focus about all these things Jesus said about money and wealth. I really want to focus on these two things or three things that God says, you know, and I really spun up about those couple of things. And, and then even just sort of, you know, from, from our own, like, regional blind spots. I mean, like, one of the things that is, is, is just really enlightening, if you read the, the biography of the life and times of Frederick Douglass, right, is, is he talks about the Bible being this book that showed him who he was, you know, that brought to life what it means to be a child of God, and yet to, to have been under the yoke of oppression from someone who used things from the Old Testament out of context to justify his oppression. And, and having, as, as an adult man, to reconcile with, here's this book that has set me free to see who I really am, and here, here is, here, how do I live in community with this person who claims to be my spiritual brother and has brought oppression to me. It, it's, it, it, and of course, as, as when all things, Frederick Douglass says it better than I. So you should see what he says to say on that particular topic. Because, because without, without the collective global movement of like, how do we read the scriptures and interpret them communally and over the course of church history, uh, we will just be prone to sort of like lock them in our own like 2023 Western sensibility, American hyper-individualistic pleasure at all costs narrative. Boom. And I'll find three or four things that make a lot of sense for me about justice and neglect a whole other things that, that might be part of the work of God trying to bring um, good news in the kingdom of God to bear. Which leads to this final point, that as we read the Bible, we need to let the Bible read us. Um, we need to let the Bible read us. So, so if we, even if we were to believe, right, and you may not be here, but that's where I am, cards on the table, I believe the Bible to be inspired. I do not believe that Scott Ann Caro is inspired. I believe that Scott Ann Caro is prone to having really crappy days, I believe that Scott Ann Caro is prone to want to look through this thing and make it say whatever I can make it say to justify whatever I feel like doing that particular day. Scott Ann Caro is a mess, but is deeply loved by God. And if you don't know me, my name is Scott Ann Caro. By the way, in case you're like, who is this Scott guy? And let me find him. And like, who is this guy? This joker is me. This joker is me, because, 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 and, and maybe you've maybe you've never been there, but like over the course of my life, I've been like, well, the you know Bible doesn't say any of this. The Bible does say, you know, just and and just the piecemealing. So when I read the Bible, and this is what the Hebrews passage was pointing to earlier about the the thoughts and the 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 the, the judgment, the judgments and the motives part of the it, it was not given permission to weaponize the Bible's a sword, so swing it at will at everybody that disagrees with you. Um, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That is a mirror pointing right back at me cutting through all kinds of the weeds of nonsense and brush that I've like constructed around and made as a defense against the things that God is trying to encourage me in and the things that God is trying to challenge me in. 
right? To, to say that my identity is found in this thing or this thing or this thing or this thing versus the thing that the scriptures say I'm, my identity is found in, which is who I am in Jesus. Ronald Rollheiser says, far too often we have our own life force confused with God and our own ideologies confused with the scriptures. And so the work of reading and interpreting scripture together is to not just read the Bible and memorize it and rattle it off for trivia purposes, but to let the Bible speak to us about us, to encourage us in areas where we'd rather not be encouraged, to challenge us in areas where we'd rather not be challenged. Dr. Joe Vital says there's really seven things to interpreting difficult Bible passages. I'll read them quickly. They're in your notes. Um, My guess is that at some point in time, you're going to come across something in the Bible that makes no sense to you. And and you're going to go, okay, throw it out, never mind, bring on Harry Potter. Like, I just do not want to deal with this. She said, but if if you find it seven things that might be helpful for you in interpreting the difficulty, uh, doing the difficult work of letting the Bible read you. Number one, where does the story fit into the grand story? If I'm reading something that's weird or off or doesn't feel right with me, where does it fit into that grand story we're talking about, which is that God desires relationship with you while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Where does it fit into that grand story? Number two, what kind of literature are you reading at the moment? Again, thinking about the work of art. Are we reading a letter? Are we reading poems? Are we reading a genealogy? Depending on what we're reading, we're going to read it differently. Number three, how does this passage contradict anything else you've read in Scripture? Or does it? Number four, how does what you're reading compare to the surrounding customs of the time? Number five, is there contrast between human behavior and God's behavior? You can't assume they are the same. The Bible is very, very Sometimes without anecdote, like sometimes I just want, like in, in, in like especially in Old Testament passages, I want, I want have someone to have said at the very tail end of the section, and we all agree that this was abhorrent behavior. Wouldn't that be helpful? Like just when you're like, oh, and there was this thing that happened, and we all agree that this was abhorrent behavior. Be- because, because frequently mankind's behavior and God's behavior in the scriptures are very different behaviors. Number six, if it's a law code in particular, it's always good to ask the question, who is it protecting? And then last but not least, how does the story ultimately point to Jesus? Um, I'll close this way. Um, I recently watched a video for a friend of mine who, from a friend of mine who does the work of Bible translation. He's helping, you know, like a col- collections of people and you bring the scriptures to life in languages where there are not current translations of the Old Testament and New Testament. And, uh, and, and so he showed me a video from East Africa in a place where it is not thought well to, to be a follower of Jesus um, and where people who are followers of Jesus are treated poorly as a result of b- believing in a resurrected Savior. Um, this unveiling, this ceremony for a Bible being translated fully after 30 years into their language. The 30-year journey to, to take the scriptures and make it translate into their language. So very careful work, very methodical work, certainly not typed into Google Translate and go. <laughs> and, and, and there was a celebration in the village that was like, in a place where, you know, flashing around this Bible might later subject these very same folks to difficult circumstances, a spirit of elation and celebration that if I'm honest with you, I don't often bring to my journey with the scriptures. I am very prone to treating this like a chore, or like an eye roll, like, okay, I gotta do my thing to get the chick mark from God, you know. I can just get really calloused and frustrated and forget the profound mystery of all of what we're talking about today, which is that God desires to be connected to you. God desires to to speak and encourage and challenge you to be reminded who you are. And so often, I I think when I interact with the Bible, one of of the things I'm seeing about myself is the need for control, the need for fast answers, and the love of confirmation bias, right? Like I'm trying to do all those things at once. And, and I'll just move, we'll move to communion by saying this. Those three things are really terrible things for intimacy. Like if you really want to be intimately connected with anybody in this universe, 
three things that will hijack that journey are control and your need to be in control, your need for fast, immediate answers to all of the things, and your confirmation bias, right? I'm going to read all these things and I'm going to draw all of these conclusions. Like the ingredient of intimacy is relationship. And this journey with the scriptures is part of and couched in a relationship with God that invites us to say, hey, spoiler alert, you're going to deal with stuff that in this life, maybe even today, that will expose to you how little you are in control of anything. And, and you're going to deal with something or someone or some situation that is so complex, is so heavy, is so weird, that any kind of fast answers will actually feel reductionist. Because all you really want is someone who's willing to walk with you. <laughs> and you, you want someone who's, who's going to seek to try to understand you. And what communion does, it's, it reminds us that in our frustration about the Bible, the, the questions that we may raise, the, the, the 47 questions that spin out of a message like the one today, the profound mystery that we aim to celebrate in our time together is that, is, that, is that God desires relationship with you. God desires to, um, to speak life to areas in your story where, where it feels like there's death. God de desires to, to challenge you in areas where you maybe feel calloused. God desires to encourage you in places that feel vulnerable and scary. We celebrate in communion that, that divine desire of God to, to walk with us, to encourage us, to, to spend the rest of our life learning, unlearning, and relearning what God's love looks like in light of the time and the challenges we face. And we do this in communion because we need each other and to be, to be reminded that, that, that like, that God desires connection with you, and not, not just because, like, I said some things into a microphone, but, but because God loves you. And that, that the thing that brings me into this room and the thing that brings you into this room is our collective inability to, like, be perfect and have it all figured out by ourselves. And so this few moments of, of kind of quiet and settling aims to remind us for all of the beef and frustrations and challenges or encouragements we find in the scripture, let's, find, let's, let's come back to who is the substance in those shadows, the person and work of Jesus. There's four stations in this room. Uh, I'll pray and invite you as your, as your desire to, to participate and to receive bread and cup. Take those back to your seat as we continue to sing and remind ourselves of the love of God together. God, I, every now and then it just feels like I, I say things into microphones that, that are so hard to live out. They're so easy to say, but they're so hard to live out. And we will spend the rest of our lives trying to, to make sense of your desire to connect with us through this word, through prayer, through the body of Christ. And so more than, than even just answering every question we have or every corollary to that question we have, God, would you just remind us of your peace and presence and desire to be connected with us. Your willingness to pour yourself out. Your willingness to be present with us. Would you help us to come back to those things? in our confusion, in our frustration, in our anger, and even in our encouragement. In the name of Jesus, our hope, we pray.